Hi, welcome to another edition of the MSDW Podcast. I'm your host, Jason Gumpert, editor at msdynamicsworld.com. I'm joined today by Dan Morneau, assistant editor, and today we are recapping a week of Microsoft Dynamics community news. We'll be recapping news from both the Directions 2016 NAV North American event, plus uh, Ignite 2016, and four very intriguing guest columns featured on the site. So stay till the end, and you'll also hear three reasons why cloud might not be right for your organization. So let's begin. I'm intrigued to hear that argument. Let's get going indeed. Jason, you traveled this week to Directions 2016, the NAV conference in Chandler, Arizona, and returned with a couple of great stories. Uh, Why don't you go ahead and tell us? Well, actually, I'll read the first headline if I can. Directions 2016, Microsoft asks NAV partners to embrace differences of Dynamics 365 opportunity. Yep, so that was uh, the best way I could... I guess, summarize what was going on that first day at Directions 2016. This is an event that's been going on for, I believe, 10 years or close to 10 years now. It's organized by NAV Partners in North America, um, and they do a great job sort of setting this up and working with Microsoft to uh, put together a program that both features information and and, and guidance from partners, but also from Microsoft. And uh, Microsoft kicked this event off with a real focus on this, uh, I guess you might call it dichotomy or divergence that's happening. Uh, you used to have convergence, but now maybe we can call it divergence because you have NAV and you have Dynamics 365. And the uh, the model or the, the picture that Microsoft painted was one of two very similar solutions with a diverging future. A cloud future versus an on-premise future was the line they tried to, uh, to draw. And it was really all about Microsoft trying to make that case for partners now in sort of this still this pre-release preview stage of, of, of Dynamics 365. And in the pre release period here for NAV 2017. Uh, both will be out quite soon, probably both within the month, or at least one of them uh, within the month. I think NAV 2017 is slated for October 24th uh, to be officially released. And uh, they want they want NAV partners on both. I think they need NAV partners on both products. And you know, trying to explain it was is no small task, though. Um, it's still very much a moving target, I think, in terms of what exactly partners need to know and should know about about 365. I think NAV 2017 is a lot more straightforward. I, I, and this gets into the second article, some of the significant improvements in, in, in NAV 2017 and Microsoft's recognition that they do need to deliver uh, not just sort of platform, but uh, actual functional improvements that, that NAV partners can show off to prospects if they can show it to existing customers to uh, justify upgrades. So that was also very much on display, but uh, but a bit, well, probably one of the most interesting uh, conferences I've been to in a long time because of this this point in time we find ourselves at with two products. One's about to launch. One is sort of about to take the next, a very, a very important step in its evolution with NAV 2017. And, uh, you know, Microsoft and partners coming together to try to make sense of it. It almost felt like we're sort of in this, you know, it almost sort of feels like a river emptying into a bay or a bay into an ocean with uh, where the water becomes brackish. And that's sort of how the conversations felt is uh, a real mix and uh, hard to sort of understand exactly what what was uh, what people were talking about sometimes and what the feelings were. Next up, from Ignite 2016, the GP conference held in Atlanta, where uh, artificial intelligence was the theme and a bit of a surprise besides. I don't know if anybody uh, who was attending the the GP conference was expecting quite the emphasis upon uh, artificial intelligence, and yet Satya Nadella took the stage for two days on uh, excuse me for two keynotes on Monday uh, morning and afternoon joined by various guests and uh, there he delivered what I what I would classify as almost an artificial intelligence manifesto. He likened it to, uh, he he called it an event, an historic event along the lines of, uh, first off, the invention of the printing press, secondly, of the World Wide Web. His idea was that there was going to be considerable step change in, uh, in the evolution of knowledge, specifically of democratizing knowledge. Uh, so he's he's looking for something completely different in the future. So I remember uh, back at the earlier major Microsoft event this year, uh, um, the uh, build event for developers, whereas so Ignite is really for IT professionals, primarily uh, build is for uh, developers and build uh, the real kind of hot topic there was bots. 
uh, and developing bots, learning about bot infrastructure, uh, learning about sort of the future of, of business that developers could sort of shape with bots. Does that does that fit? factor into AI or was this really just moving in a whole nother visionary direction as from what you saw? It factors into AI indeed. In fact, there were two uh, pretty impressive demonstrations. Well, uh, the, the first one was Dion Sanders. Dion Sanders took the stage and to demonstrate an AI-fueled bot that Microsoft is working with the NFL for, for fantasy football. And here's what's interesting is that then and there, they came up with a quarterback matchup and Deion Sanders looked at it and uh, and they asked him, well, Deion, what do you think? And he said, hmm. <laughs> <laughs> he, was, he was charmingly underwhelmed with it, but... Yeah, but after a minute or two, he looked at it and he said, hey, you know, one thing this does that I didn't think of was that it takes weather out of the factor because it's a domed stadium. He says, uh, I guess that would have slipped my mind. So at any rate, he uh, he conceded that it uh, the quarterback matchup was, he thought, a good one. A second one, a second one was a long demonstration, and this was a sort of a, a an AI interface developed for Lowe's, and this is around home remodeling. So we were, I, I take it this thing proves what AI can do. It for example, uh, uh, this young couple came up and it mined everything from emails to the young woman's Pinterest board to see what interested her and came up with some eerily accurate suggestions for this couple. They didn't hate anything they saw. And you know how young couples are. I hate this. I hate that. I don't like brass. My grandma had pewter. Stripes. I yeah. Want stripes. Yeah. <laughs> they, were, uh, they were actually uh, pretty pleased with the result. And so we had an AI slash sort of mm. bot mashup there, plus HoloLens. Of course, they had to wear HoloLens and uh, see the kitchen as if it was absolutely mm-hmm. real. And I will say this to Microsoft, that was a very impressive demonstration that went on three times longer than was entirely necessary. <laughs> you know, there's only, <laughs> there's only so fun watching somebody else remodel is. You know? <laughs> if a little if a little hollow lens is good, a lot of hollow lens is gotta be better. <laughs> and you know, here's the thing is that uh, Nadella spoke and this is the word he used, and this was almost, you know, in the first first couple of sentences was, he's going to democratize AI. Pretty much everybody yeah. and every organization will have access to AI. Uh, they're going to release the uh, uh, release the IP. Nadella will claims that Microsoft will work this into every commercial Microsoft product. And of course, mm-hmm. he started off with with Office 365 and uh, you know more user facing products. And yet, Dynamics 365 and Dynamics CRM, of course, will be the first to uh, to have AI native. So it doesn't look like AI is going to yeah. be you know a package, any kind of uh, module or packaged offering or bolt on. No, this is going to be native. And the end result is, uh, and he emphasized this several times, it's analytics. How, whatever you think of AI, and there was even a science fiction flick called AI a few years ago. Uh, I forget the plot. But uh, whatever you've heard about AI, it is not about games. As a matter of fact, that was mm-hmm. the first sentence practically out of his mouth was, we're not doing this so you can play magnificent games. We're doing this to deliver intelligence wherever it's needed. And the interface is kind of Cortana, but an awful lot of uh, intelligence behind Cortana that enables, uh, you know, fantasy football, which which Nadella described as the single most data-driven uh, application, I think is the word he used, of intelligence that he had ever yeah. seen. So you know, it's it's interesting because um, I really wasn't. You were kind of following Ignite while I was following Directions that, this week as they overlap, and there was actually a strong component of Microsoft showing off pretty nice progress in that theme of democratizing AI, at least democratizing machine learning. I don't know if that 
officially uh, lines up with what, what Microsoft calls AI from an Ignite perspective. But there was uh, uh, some, some, like I said, some there were a couple of good examples. Microsoft actually made an effort with Nav 2017, and they're making an effort with Dynamic 365 to uh, show us or to show, I guess, their prospective customers in that SMB range that they too can take advantage of machine learning. There's a, there's several pre-built, I think maybe about four pre-built forecasting facilities, I guess you'd call them, or functions where you can, if you have NAV 2017, for example, it's not SaaS, so you would have to you know, provision your own machine learning, Azure Machine Learning instance, um, set up some pre-built uh, models, but you can then tie those in with literally just like an API key and a, a couple pieces of information from Azure, and it then knows to look for um, you know inventory data or, or vendor data and plug that into these pre-built models, and you're all of a sudden getting machine learning forecasts pulled directly into your ERP without any data scientists and really without anything other than having the raw data on hand uh, and enough raw data, you know, with enough enough history to it, so that the machine learning can you know can build a model and learn learn from it based on the data that you have. And there, the uh, you know, I know they have more plans for that. You mentioned CRM, and yeah, it's, it's certainly. It certainly that sort of thing will certainly filter into CRM, and we've been hearing this on the AX side too. So you know, while those consumer-facing examples are really cool, I think maybe Microsoft's doing some of the similar things a little quiet, maybe a little more quietly on the uh, uh, on the ERP and CRM side too. But I mean, in my in my view, they should be shouting it from the hilltops. I think it's really cool stuff, and it's very competitive. It has to be very competitive uh, with you know you're, you're hearing new things from Salesforce about AI the same week. So indeed, indeed, and and one thing about AI, because there is so much data behind it, because there is so much intelligence, and there has to be in order for it to achieve like those eerily accurate uh, kitchen designs among you know certainly among other applications, uh, is that that it is very, of course, uh, CPU intensive, and the average Sanders was speaking. Uh, Sanders was uh, using a just an ordinary production laptop. But you know how how is the world going to handle this tremendous amount of data? Well, it turns out that Microsoft was quietly, as you were saying, uh, essentially building an AI supercomputer while while we slept. Uh, that was the next. Headline we had here, Microsoft AI tech promises to touch consumers enterprise with hyperscale performance. It turns out that they have, uh, they're returning to silicon versus CPUs. They're, they put what are called FPGAs, ultra high capacity uh, nodes into 15 of the Microsoft data centers worldwide. And these things supposedly have the practically scientifically negligible latency, almost real time, and uh, certainly has the enormous capacity that that is required. So Microsoft conceived this uh, a couple of years ago, I believe, and I forget the name of the project they called it. But at the time, uh, you know, this was something in the future and partners, of course, at at conferences were interested in what do you got today? Well, here's what they have today is uh, an artificial intelligence supercomputer. And it's called an AI supercomputer that sits in, you know, Azure, uh, sits in the Microsoft cloud. But of course, it is presumably available to folks who elect to put perhaps, uh, you know, their CRM in Azure or, or maybe in short order, their AX, their NAV. Yeah, I mean, what what I've seen from uh, just from the Nav team again, because I heard them speak most recently, was they were making an effort to essentially put a layer, a development layer, into Nav that makes it possible for uh, you know a, a knowledgeable Nav developer who doesn't know AI supercomputer their way around an AI su- supercomputer in Azure to just um, you know use an interface that they understand to connect in. And uh, I don't know. Again, I don't know if it was. This particular example was using that technology, but but to but to write code that can that can hook into it and uh, leave all those super complex uh, you know elements of it to the folks who really understand that stuff and just bring it back into the system that end users are going to benefit from. And I I I just say that because I imagine that R and D teams around Microsoft kind of have that marching order. You need to make this um, easy to access for people who maybe aren't going to be data scientists. 
Funny you mention, because we had a third piece, how serious is Microsoft about AI? Company launches 5,000 strong Microsoft AI and research group. And this will be headed up by Harry Shum, who is a 20-year veteran of Microsoft research. And this will be a global team of scientists, programmers, researchers. And what's interesting is that this used to be the Microsoft Research Group. Now it is the Microsoft AI and Research Group. So that tells you how serious that is. I tried all week to find out, okay, it's going to be 5,000 strong. How many do you have already in the research group? Yeah, that's my question. I I couldn't nail it down, uh, no matter how hard I tried. But of course, this research group is global. It's in London. It's in Manhattan. It's in uh, uh, Seoul, I believe. So put it all together and there will be considerable boots on the ground ground researching and delivering AI product into uh, into Microsoft product. So I, I've got a feeling that whatever's coming is going to come really rapidly and be practical. Well, it already is practical at Lowe's. It already is practical at the NFL. Broadly practical in Boy, I would say the way they're handling this, they sort of like their big announcements. I don't know. What would be the next conference? Because I guarantee yeah. you know, that'll be it. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's uh, – there's in- <laughs> I'm trying to think. So there's 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 Build. Well, mm-hmm. I guess Envision's the next one, and that's in February. Envision in February. And that's more sort of you know, the user vision kind of show. So I think it's a good bet that they would show something related to this then, maybe some progress. You know, I can't help but be a tad curious about what democratized EI is going to look like because you look back, and here I'm using Nadella's own examples. The printing press democratized books, and the World Wide Web democratized exchange of information. All well and good, but you know, when the when the printing press was was conceived in the 1400s, the world had 30,000 books, 25,000 of which I'm sure were the Bible. The rest were, you know, sort of uh, king- about, about the Bible. <laughs> yeah, yeah, or the rest were some kind of kingly pamphlet on on whatever. Uh, I believe the Quran and the Torah are not were not printed initially; they were in scrolls. So solid books. Uh, and as soon as we got it democratized, we quickly descended into stuff like Gulliver's Travels. And uh, what happened to the early internet back when we were using search engines that hardly any of us will remember, Earthlink, things like that, uh, where Yahoo, yeah, Yahoo was number one, if I recall correctly. I recall hearing, well, it's been a year, and how are, how are consumers using the World Wide Web? And this was like on CBS News or something like that. And it said the top three search categories were, ready for this, Three Stooges, NHL hockey, and pornography. So we do know that the early users of the World Wide Web and search were the 18 to 24 demographic. <laughs> yeah. Well, we've got we've already got shopping and and sports. So I guess we know what the that's true. Be. That's true. <laughs> That's true, but we know Rolls. We know Rolls Royce. But the other thing too is the citizen developer. I'm curious to see if the citizen developer who who put up the uh, Three Stooges, you know, intelligence products <laughs> on the on the web, if you can call them that, is uh, what he's going to do with artificial right. intelligence. I I have no idea. No idea. How about we move on to these intriguing guest columns? We yeah, let's do week. it. Yeah, we had four intriguing guest columns stretching CRM, GP, and AX, and finally that bit of healthy skepticism about the cloud that we mentioned. Uh, first off, a Microsoft Dynamics AX integration framework, why AIF, web services, and data management are not enough. And this is from Don Riggs, Senior Director of AX Applications, or excuse me, a Senior Director and AX Applications Architect at Invista. Yeah, so Don really... Uh made a, a very strong case and, and a thoughtful case, I think, for um, why he is seeing a need for uh, some very important additions to 
I guess the standard Dynamics AX data model or not data model architecture, and that it really does need a uh, integration framework, as you know, as the title says, beyond those other those other tools that Microsoft gives you. And, and I'm not going to try to sort of argue his full case here, but it's a uh, it's an interesting case, it's a compelling case, and it's one that uh, I know a lot of people have already noted. Uh, it's gotten quite quite good uh, traffic so far on the site, and I think it'll even pick up more next week. But um, you know, as as we've seen in other cases, when a new release of AX comes out, um, you have some very experienced and uh, savvy, you know, solution architects and developers who are looking at this at all sorts of different uh, perspectives and at different angles. And you know, the need for uh, the need for integrate good in a good solid integration is is key. And uh, Don's been around a, a long time and knows this well. I think from firsthand experience. I think you know his his firm and, and Vista has their own framework that they've actually built because they did they did feel that um, that the integration framework uh, the integration tools that come with AX were not sufficient. And you know and Don can explain to anyone who wants to listen very well why uh, why the, the core product falls short and why that's probably a risk. Um, so. I I don't think it's the end of this conversation by any means. I think this is something that will continue to be discussed. No, no, indeed. And uh, for folks who just like a good read, uh, Don Riggs ain't afraid to say nothing. So uh, uh, he's, he's he's good for a bold yeah. quote and a strong opinion about, about product, about Microsoft, about where he thinks it failed and where he thinks it's going to succeed. So uh, Don Riggs is always, always a great read. Next up is Windows 2000. CapEx and IT budget alignment, three reasons the cloud is not right for your organization. And this is by Brian Sally, Channel Development Director at Concerto. Yeah, so uh, a new piece that just went up and, uh, you know, Concerto Cloud Services obviously focus on providing cloud solutions uh, and they do a lot in the dynamic space. And this piece really just breaks down uh, some of the things that uh, Brian knows as a veteran of that space in terms of, you know, when you're not going to be able to make the case for for uh, moving to the cloud. And he, you know, it's right in the title there. So, you know, CapEx, um, IT budget alignment, Windows 2000 legacy, um, you know, legacy architectures are three reasons where, and, and they are very specific reasons. And he, he, he gives some, some very specific examples, undoubtedly from, from you know, his own experience and in, in working with, with different organizations. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's nice to, I think, get, get some very specific ways to dig into here's why cloud doesn't provide, here, here's certain ways the cloud uh, doesn't provide uh, value in you know, certain scenarios where there's just uh, rea certain realities that a business has to account for. Yeah, and it's interesting that one of the top value propositions, practical point, that you're always given by a SaaS provider is that this is subscription and therefore you are able to move away from CapEx and into OpEx, into your operating budget, uh, which in, in short, pay by the drink uh, as opposed to you know the one-time one -time purchase. And yet maybe there's com companies out there that are simply used to CapEx, want to use CapEx, and that's where software projects reside. Okay, next up is your CRM system, Nemesis or ally of the sales team. This was by Pani Harito, CRM sales lead of Mint South Africa. Uh, yeah, Pani is a, uh, so it's great to have him contributing another uh, article. And this is a, a piece that uh, comes out of you know, firsthand experience working with CRM. Um, Mint obviously is a, a major player in dynamic CRM solutions in South Africa. And, uh, you know, Pani has plenty of experience with sales and CRM systems and makes a very good and, and a very sort of fundamental point about what is CRM and what is its uh, what is a good CRM system really going to do for a company? It's not going to uh, just be, you're not just building a better data entry entry system that, for the sales reps to give the uh, executives better reports. It has to actually give the sales reps tools to make the, to allow them to do their jobs better, tracking key opportunities, reminders and follow-ups that can be used very efficiently and effectively to actually help you do, do your job better and, and close more deals, automation, streamlining of processes like quote quoting and uh, appointment setting you know just very specific things that when you're talking about salesforce automation you're talking about what uh, what can actually help you know and that's ultimately i think you know and it's 
the case has been made before. It's not a brand, brand new point, but you know, if you can make the sales team, sales manager, sales reps do their jobs better, they're going to want to use the system because they see the actual tangible advantages for them, um, which is obviously so important when you're talking about motivating uh, uh, sales professionals. Yeah, something that Pani uh, pointed out that I've heard a couple of times recently is that when do you know CRM has failed? When using CRM becomes a part-time job of its own or the job becomes the care and feeding of CRM and a salesperson can quickly descend into that if that salesperson is expected to document meticulously every contact, is expected to do it real time, then somebody's really not on a sales call. Somebody is, you know, hunting something to feed into CRM. So yeah, at the point at which it becomes a real task for the salesperson is the point of failure. Uh, The point that it becomes useful to the salesperson is when it feels like it's on the fly and all of a sudden there's tons of intelligence whenever they need it. And so uh, the- let me try to bring the point kind of way back to earlier in the in the podcast here, Dan. So, um, you know, we got, uh, we have the Dynamics 365 launch coming up at, uh, before the UG Summit. And we also have, and that also includes uh, a whole new round of CRM focused capabilities that are going to be announced. And I've heard people say there's really some big stuff coming there. Uh, you know, you fold in AI. I think that that's going to be an element of it. Maybe not called AI. It might be machine learning. It might be sort of um, uh, other sort of cognitive services in terms of how it's positioned. But, you know, you take that and you take sort of this perennial concern or risk with CRM about adoption and um, it not fulfilling its full purpose and uh, falling flat in, inside of an organization. And, you know, to me, there's the future of, of, of kind of core CRM capabilities and especially what Microsoft has been sort of pushing toward in the last few years when they started introducing task guides and they started... Um, improving their mobile offerings. And now we're seeing more and more push around different sort of Microsoft business solutions to bring AI or bring, you know, intelligence from Azure into the, into the product in very seamless ways, the, you know, where sort of people are working and making decisions. Hey, I'm going to put a, put a uh, prediction out there that that's going to be one of the key improvements that, that people will see in the next release of CRM. I have no idea, but uh, certainly seems to be leading that way. And it uh, wouldn't surprise me if, uh, you know, that'll be part of Microsoft's case. And, you know, having been to several of these CRM user group uh, summit events, user adoption is always a big topic and people love to talk about it because it continues to be a challenge for them. Yeah. Interestingly, we did a profile just a few weeks ago, a CRM UG summit profile of Daniel Madden. Daniel is with SEI and he is delivering, uh, no kidding, four seminars at CRM UG Summit 2016 on user adoption of CRM. One of them is called Epic Fail CRM Adoptive Strategies. Another one is User Adoption Panel. A third is the the role of managers and executive leaders in user adoption. And interestingly, this is such an old story. It just doesn't change. This is precisely what they were saying about CRM 20 years ago, 20 years ago when it was uh, was fairly new. And back then, you know, it was undoubtedly terribly clunky. I remember the ones that I saw were just an awful lot of work. They weren't intuitive. Uh, and again, they were a, a real chore that you had to get a salesperson to learn instead of Excel, which they knew perfectly well. But Madden points out that no, 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 no. You know, that is something that still prominent today. You, It seems like you can't make this stuff easy or uh, make a more intuitive user experience. There, there's no such thing as too good or too intuitive a user experience, I guess what you're saying. Yeah, I would uh, agree with that. And there's always room for making... <laughs> And, and, you know, a lot of it is just, uh, I mean, as the tools improve, uh, the, the challenges with the people behind the tools remain the same. I mean, you can have a great set of tools, but struggle to just get them out there in, in front of people. Or the other thing is an organization started off small and they didn't have CRM yet and people got used to Excel. So now they've got CRM. So maybe that's part of the reason why it happens today is because CRM is new 
to an organization at some point, and perhaps like any other application, it folks look at it and say, but I'm doing fine with my Excel. Next up was user-defined fields in Microsoft Dynamics GP Payroll. Have you defined yours? This by Chris Haddon, Technical Sales Manager at Greenshade Software. This was a great, very practical sort of how-to piece, and interestingly, we recently conducted a readership survey. We're still in the middle of it, but uh, most folks or the leading request for we'd like to see more of, we'd like to see more how-tos, and this one is a, is a very practical one that you can put to work this afternoon. Essentially what it is is you've got these two user-defined fields in uh, GP payroll. can be absolutely anything. What unique in employee information do you track? Maybe it's the phones and other equipment that you put out there. Maybe it's calibration equipment that you put out there or something that not every organization is going to have. Uh, maybe it's ACA status, Affordable Care Act status. Uh, I'm a little surprised that's not in there, but uh, but I'm sure it will be. So there are these user-defined fields, and Chris used the example of ice cream flavor. I don't know. Somebody's birthday comes up. Maybe you want their, their favorite ice cream. Uh, well, you've got a user-defined field to know who likes strawberries. Something I couldn't help think about was, suppose we had this capability back in like the 30s or 40s, we could use it to do things like, uh, uh, you know, ethnicity so we can segregate people <laughs> or, or otherwise make a, a 30s, 40s use out of it. Make sure that, it, it, you know, Italians and Irish don't work together because they fight <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. something absurd like that. Yeah. Uh, but well, at I, any rate. I think it's, you, yeah. you know, the ACA uh, example is a good one. And I, I think it's one that uh, Green Shades understands. Well, you mentioned GP doesn't really fully cover the needs for ACA reporting. Uh, Green Shades is one of the competitors in that space. There are others as well, but uh, but I think they did a, a nice job of sort of m mentioning how that can be a way that companies like like them and others um, use it as sort of a starting point that they can they can sort of take some of these lesser known, you know, flexible points within GP and, and use them to, to lever off of to build their own solutions because the, the ACA stuff is really a, is really a bear. If you're not, if you're not uh, on top of it. Well, it just occurred to me that, for example, uh, nurses. Nurses come in many designations. There's the licensed practicing. There's the registered nurse. There's the sort of physician's assistant slash nurse. And yeah. if you're a, a healthcare organization, this would be where you would do that. And uh, You know, it's uh, funny with GP, HR, and payroll. Um, it's a pretty in-depth module that, that is probably underused by GP users, by GP customers, because um, it can do a lot of different things in both the HR and the, you know, the straight payroll management. And companies either aren't aware of it or they're, they're using third parties uh, or they're just not doing a very good job with those functions, perhaps. And, uh, you know, I think something like this, it's actually funny. It's like two fields, only two fields, no more than two fields. It's field one and field two, um, which is sort of harkens back in my mind to maybe, and I don't know the history of that. It would maybe be interesting to have someone who really understands that talk to us about it, but it's just that funny little thing to see just two fields and, and, and only two fields for you to use to, to add categories or attributes to your to your employees, right? Well, it does beg the question, why aren't there more? Yeah. Suppose, suppose, for example, you wanted to use this, uh, we've heard many times about, how, uh, what's the term for it? It's, it surrounds skill sets. Is it a catalog or, or some essential, some way to track uh, Competency uh, or there, the, you know, uh, educational yeah. certifications, that kind of thing? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so I've got two fields. I mean, hey, on the on the other hand, they make it uh, they make it pretty clear. If you really need more than two fields, you probably should be looking at a more comprehensive uh, solution for this kind of thing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's 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 another way to fix it. If you're managing personnel so. for a hospital, you probably aren't using these two custom fields in your accounting solution to do it. I mean, maybe you could, but um, yeah. hopefully, your your company's invested in something a, a little more substantial. Well, that actually leads in nicely. Uh, next week, uh, I was going to ask you what you're going to do, but I'll mention first that uh, I spoke to someone this week about GP, about how surprisingly good it is for multinational and surprisingly good it is for complex financial environments. In this case, it's nonprofits. And 
uh, nonprofits turn out to be, uh, nonprofits and government organizations, they turn out to have, first off, an awful lot of money moving around, an awful lot of accountability, an awful lot of the regulation that surrounds contribution. Uh, and they've also got, surprisingly, uh, an awful lot of logistics. So it'll be intriguing to hear more about what GB, GP can do there. Then I will also look into an EDI and logistics case study in Food and Bev, and that's from Data Masons. And then we'll delve into, and this is a fun one, Eclipse Royalty and Rights Management for Franchisers. This too is GP-based, and uh, this is another very interesting, complex industry, one that actually has a few lessons for the rest of us out there. So uh, that'll be a compelling read. And finally, a two-parter on the Internet of Things. First off, we're going to look at the industries it serves, or excuse me, first off, we'll look at how to get started. Both Columbus and Ebex weigh in, telling us how to start small or that we should start small. And then we'll look at industries where there's maintenance and manufacturing and supply chain. Those are obvious uses, but how about your retail outlets, equipment and rental shops? We'll explore the untapped and, uh, and less obvious uses of the Internet of Things. So uh, what have you got going, Jason? Well, I'm definitely looking forward to those IoT pieces. I think we'll have a lot. Uh, that will become a, a bigger and bigger story as we move into the future here. But um, So we have uh, a, some more look ahead at uh, the Dynamics 365 launch. I'll be hosting uh, Steve Mordew, who's a pretty uh, prolific blogger and uh, owner of an ISV business himself that focuses on CRM, Rapid Start CRM, talking about some of the things he's been seeing in the field in the partner channel. Um, we'll also be just looking to get a little more of a read on partners' responses coming out of last week's event and looking forward to uh, last week's Directions, NAB Directions event, and looking forward to the Summit event, which will coincide with the Dynamics 365 launch event. We'll also be, I think uh, you mentioned it earlier, but starting to dive into some of the new survey data um, that's coming out of our uh, most recent reader survey that just ra wraps up, I guess wraps up this week actually. So we'll be uh, starting to pull that apart, look at uh, not only what readers want, but some of the readers' attitudes with a focus on digital transformation. Super. Well, let's wrap up. All right, let's do that. So this has been another edition of the MSDW podcast. Thank you so much for listening. If you'd like to be on the podcast or maybe you're an ISV with a product release or a consultant with a new case study or a, just a unique slant on the Microsoft Dynamics channel, please get in touch. I am Jason Gumpert. You can reach me by email, jgumpert at msdynamicsworld.com. And I'm Dan Morno, assistant editor at D-M-A-U-R-N-O at msdynamicsworld.com. Thanks, Dan. And until next time, we're MS Dynamics World signing off. <laughs>